thank you to our acolytes this morning. That was uh, enjoyable, but usually acolytes just to, you know, they turn on the lights. It's special. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to see you all here. We've got a nice gentle rain right now, which is really nice. And it stays gentle while we're in here. Do we have any announcements? Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> Here is the golden list. Lists. Seven families. We, we have Nancy. some, some real microphone. Oh. We have some real champions this year. I mean real challenges. We have I talked to this lady. I have never been so impressed in my life. This lady is 86. She is raising her 14 and 16 year old grandsons. I thought, does that take courage? Uh, we have 16 children from the age of 5 to 16. We have double twins. Uh, we have 11 adults. We have a family of husband and wife that are elderly. <laughs> and they are raising two children, six and eleven. So we have our hands full. Um, with the kids, we will need cereals, <clears throat> mac and cheese, we will need mashed potatoes and gravy. We will need every, I can see right here, a lot of stuff that we're really going to need. So anyway, the cutoff date is the 19th. That gives me time to go through the groceries. What we don't have, we have gotten some monetary donations. We can go to the grocery store. And of course, they'll get their gift certificates. They were all very excited. I called every family. They can't believe that they were selected from NISAP. Two of the ladies said, we filled the forms out, but we never thought we'd hear from anybody. I said, you haven't seen Emory at work. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get Thanksgiving under our belt first, and then we'll worry about Christmas. Um, I have been given, this is kind of a problem for me, I have been given six large cartons of children's brand new books from Random House. There are color books. There are stuffed animals in some of the books. My problem is I can get my neighbor possibly get them in my car. But getting here to the church is going to be a little bit of a challenge to get them back out. Um, I can pick them. I have to pick them up, she said, tomorrow morning at 930. Or otherwise, she's donating to somebody else. So if any of you are going to be around, I can put them in shopping bags and carry them back and forth. I just can't kick, pick up the cartons. So, Nancy, anybody's going to be I'll around? Pick, I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock. Oh, no. The, the neighbor upstairs, he says, I'll put them in the car for you. I have also been given a huge, it, it's some kind of plastic wagon. I mean, the thing is big. I don't know whether the church could use it to carry the groceries back and forth, carry books, carry whatever. But I'm going to bring you all the wagon, and you all decide what you want to do with it. But that's another way I can get the books in, but I just can't pick up the cart. So um, what are you asking party. for help with? Do you need help here? Yes. And just I'll, I'll meet time. you here at the church. What time? I'm meeting her at 9.30. So it'll take me probably an hour to get the books in the car. 10.30 So 10.30 would be great here. Monday. I, I can leave them in the car overnight if it's better for the next day. But they're all brand new books and I need 
they are piled. Some of them will have to be put in bags because they're falling out of the boxes. But he worked at Random House for 27 years. And every month they gave books away. And he would collect them and have a yard sale once a year. So this year he didn't have his yard sale. And this year we are loaded with. Um, so anyway. Thank God for blessings. This is wonderful. But we do have a lot of kids. Nancy, and I want the wagon for the church. Each weekend we can bring donations up and bless them. <coughs> guys don't have to care if they Absolutely. <laughs> this is a beautiful, big, I mean, big wagon. Do we need horses to pull it? <laughs> no. Oh, we, okay. Two, two big healthy dogs. We could. Okay. Let's get going. Do we have any other announcements? Okay. Hello. Um, it ends up that we do have one more ticket for Sight and Sound. So if somebody would like to go, let me know today. And um, we are we're, we have registered to do the sports board at Hershey Farms, and it's twenty two ninety five a person, and it sounds awesome. So we got the last spot for that. So um, we're ready to go. Just if one more person wants to go, that's great. If not, we're going with twenty nine. What's the date again? Tuesday, December fifth, seventy one dollars, with the possibility of probably getting a few bucks back. And I really have paid, right? You really have paid. You really remember. just cashed your check. Good morning. I want to introduce our special guest this morning, Linda Baker, our guest Luda. She's going to accompany the choir and also play a solo later on. So welcome, Linda. Um, Linda's been a teacher in Carroll County Public Schools for one long time. <laughs> and right now she's at Carrolltown Elementary. We're very grateful to have her, and thanks to George for asking her to, to come. Um, if any of you would like tickets for the New Wave Singers concert in December, um, I can get those for you. I'm going to see them again later this month. We've got two concerts, one on the 9th, December 9th, at 7 at Emmanuel um, UCC in Catonsville and Sunday the 10th at 4 at Emmanuel Episcopal downtown on Cathedral. That's at 4. Yeah, Sunday at 4, Saturday at 7. So if you'd like to go to either one of those, let me know which one, and I'll get the tickets at my next rehearsal. I just wanted to let everybody know that NESAP right now has their challenge, and I think it's through December the 15th. So any money donations, they have a match. So um, if anybody's interested, you can just make your check and send it to NESAP. Good morning. We have some good news. We have our three grandsons with us today. And Wednesday, Kate, where are we going next week? with me for the Carol Singers concert in November if you want and I'll have them from now until right before the concert. That was the dates again. What's the dates again? 27th and 28th. Monday night and Tuesday night. I just had a quick uh, thing I wanted to know. When I was coming in it looked like somebody's lights were on. It was a light green Toyota, maybe a Camry it, or an Avalon. It was Sue's and I wanted to turn them off. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Have you heard what she said? It's your turn in the bucket. Well, if nobody's going to raise their hand, I already got one. 
Number 540 in the red hymnal. My hope is, yeah, my hope is in the Lord. Wait a minute, never mind. That's too hard. That's too hard to say. <laughs> Let's go right next door, 539. My faith looks up to thee. From verses 1 and 4.
and joy. We bring heart, soul, mind, and body. We share blessings and fears. We bring faith and doubt. With all that we are and all that we have, let us worship God. Remain standing for the opening hymn for all the saints, 711. Virginia Mann, Bill Bochamp, Bill Bochamp, he, he's up there, Ruth Hack, and our latest loss, Frida Grooms. These four candles put out a fair amount of light, reminding us that those that we have known and lost are with God and are light uh, to the world. And all these other little cups we have are for you to share uh, the names you would like to share um, from your family, your friends this year, for whenever. So 
So just say it out loud. Give us time to light the candle. Say the names as loud as you can so everybody can hear them. Scott Roberts. Scott Warnick. Nancy Hedrick. Pauline Pipes. Lois Weinbach. We're having a lighter malfunction. Can you get up one of the flippers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
All those who've died in natural disasters across this nation and others. All those who lost their life due to drunk drivers. who died from opioid addiction. All the first responders who died in the line of duty. And finally, all those who lost their lives but were homeless and unclaimed. All the soldiers who fight for our freedom. that shines is intensified every time the soul goes home to God. And the light that is Christ continues in our lives. Let's take a moment of silence and then join together in our opening prayer. Please rise in harder posture as we pray for holiness of heart. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. in their hands. 
they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship Him day and night within His temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. For the next is the epistle lesson, 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Children of God, also new, uh, new Revised Standard Version. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The, world, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise and part a posture for the uh, gospel, please. This is a familiar one. It's the Beatitudes. Um, I had a youth group that used to call them the Be Happy Tudes. Um, so if you um, would read along with me. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when the people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thus ends the reading from our Holy Scripture. We give God the adoration, praise, and thanksgiving.
That was lovely. And thank you, Linda. I have a special appreciation for flute because my youngest is also a flutist. She doesn't like flats, but a flutist. Um, and I think that adds wonders to any of the music. It's time for us to share our joys and concerns with one another, and I ask you uh, to share them with the idea that God listens all the time. I would like to rejoice in having my seatmate back. <laughs> um, I would also like to ask for prayer. I have a dear friend that's actually my traveling companion that I go to Jamaica with, and her father has been suffering with lung cancer for many, many years, and has miraculously, by the grace of God and by great attention and love by his daughter, Marilyn, and healed of that when he was in stage four lung cancer. Yeah. And because of the treatments he's been getting, um, apparently he is really having profuse problems with breathing and has now gotten shingles and is in really, really bad shape. His name is John Clayton, and his daughter, Marilyn, is so dedicated and devoted to her father and really does devote her life to try and make him better. I would hope that you all would play, pray for Marilyn and her sister June and for her father John Clayton. Please let them know that we are here for them. Have a joy. Our grandson got married last Sunday. It was an outside wedding and we had a beautiful day, unlike this morning. <laughs> I wish them best of luck. Thank you. Pastor Peggy, I forgot to give you the cards, so I have the cards to go out to our circle friends. Okay. okay. So I will give them to you. So they are here. All right. Remind me as I leave that you're giving them to me. <laughs> I went to the doctor the other day. I'm fine. <laughs> people. I talked to uh, Frida's daughter and they would like to have the donation they made go to the front doors. Um, they went home and thought about it. Um, so if we can, I don't know how you have to shift things around or just change it, but. Um, I haven't done it yet, so it just started coming in. So okay. I, I will see that that's where it goes. Okay. And then let us know what needs, how much we need to make it happen. You know, God waits to hear from us ever so patiently because we don't do it nearly as often as we could. Um, you know, Scripture tells us that we should pray always. So, um, I want us to join in prayer thinking about the prayers that have been lifted, but also thinking about each of the names that were raised aloud and are four from the congregation um, this year. So. Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, we thank you for all the blessings that you bring to us, for all the ways that you bless us, and all the people who pass through our lives that change who we are just a little bit, and sometimes a whole lot. We give you thanks for each of the names that were raised aloud this morning in remembrance, and pledge to remember always. We give you thanks for all the folks who were raised in prayer and for the blessings and the joys. Um, for Cade being as healthy as he is and sort of helping to be the acolyte. And for Nancy being free uh, of her cancer and for Diana's friends. Um, for all that they need uh, from 
healing from the cancer to just simply dealing with shingles and all that goes on uh, with that. We give you joy for weddings that take place, for babies that are born, for hearts that are changed, and for the graciousness of music that lifts our spirits and sings along with our souls. This morning we give you thanks that it is All Saints Sunday. We give you thanks that it is our Harvest Sunday. And we thank you for the harvest that has been brought into the church. And we pray that it continue each week until December 19th, like Nancy's in. You know, God, we humans sometimes need to be reminded a lot. So please remind us when we don't quite step up to the plate. But hear our thanks. Hear our gratitude. Hear our love. And now we pray the prayer that you as our Christ taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I ask that the ushers come forward to receive um, the offering, and if you would do the stuff down there that I usually do one more time. It's here. It's here. Me too, John. Please rise for the doxology. remembers all those who have gone on to be with God. 
especially in this last year. We're called to remember always, and what that means is a deep remembering, not just a flashing through every now and again of remembering. When we lit these candles earlier in the service, that is a strong visual of that connection that we still have with those who have gone, I put it, gone home to God before us. Because when folks leave us, they don't truly leave us completely. They're in our hearts and in our memories, but they're also in that relationship that we have with God. And we understand that when our time comes, which for us we hope is not any time soon, that they will be there waiting for us. And that they are aware of what is going on in our lives. And as some folks would say, looking down and helping. Revelation is a very misunderstood book of the Bible. A lot of commercial venues trying to make money on people's faith by misleading them about what the scripture is about. The Left Behind series are a good example of this. If you go to see them or have seen them, take them as a nice fictional movie. But nothing that God intended uh, when he gave John this vision on Patmos. There have been times when the idea of this great cloud of witnesses does come into play. If you saw the 1984 movie Places in the Heart, it's set in the Depression, and recently widowed Edna, who was played by Sally Field, is trying to support her two young children and pay her mortgage by growing cotton on a small farm. She has two helpers, a black itinerant worker played by Danny Glover, and a third boarder named, who was played by John Malkovich. And together they weather a sea of difficulties, uh, including a tornado, and what all of these things do is teach them the value of relationship, of family. The closing scene in the film takes place in a church. And this is where I see this scripture at play. As the camera slowly pans the congregation receiving communion, we recognize all the characters as if we had a movie camera up here going across we would recognize those who were here. But in this scene, those living and dead and departed are also there. And that is a beautiful image of the communion of saints when we realize they're here with us. Geddes McGregor in The Rhythm of God tells of a priest when asked how many people were at the early celebration of the Eucharist last Wednesday morning, and he replied, there were three old ladies, the janitor, several thousand archangels, a large number of seraphim, and several million of the triumphant saints of God. <laughs> so when we're complaining about not enough people in church, we have to remember those last things, the archangels, the seraphim, and the triumphant saints of God. <laughs> To have this large number of witnesses who call us home when our time comes is like having a road map to the plan God has for the redemption of humankind in the book of Revelation. Revelation was written at a time when many Christians were being per persecuted for their testimony to Jesus, and there's nothing desirable about persecution. I'm having trouble. I had trouble keeping these on my head this morning. Persecution is about <coughs> suffering, and it put people under tremendous pressure to renounce their faith. The book of Revelation was written to seek to strengthen and warn God's people to remain steadfast. After tribulation will come victory and rest. And so the picture in Revelation 7 is of the triumph of those who come through bitter persecution. Now in the modern church, we don't face persecution. We may have people who don't understand and family who make fun of us, but we certainly aren't being persecuted, at least not in America. For John, it was just another day, and the first century Christian that he was, was at worship. The thing about where he was at worship 
is that he was in prison. He worshipped God every Lord's Day, because that's what Christians do. But he was in prison on account of the gospel. His crime against the Roman government was to be a Christian. For whatever reason, he wasn't taken to the gladiators or the lions or the fire pits. But as he worshipped, um, he had to do it in secret because the guards would have noticed. Probably in the early hours, as the guards snoozed at their posts, maybe. But here he was on this island of Patmos. And we hear about the visions of John on the island of Patmos, but we don't hear the vision of John that he had when he was in prison on the island of Patmos. To the Roman guards, it was just another day. The Romans had gone to a lot of trouble to keep John and others from worshiping Christ, and they thought that they had succeeded by striking terror into the hearts of all Christians. Many had been fed to the lions. Many had been run through by the gladiators. Many were set ablaze to light the games. They were put on posts and set ablaze. In spite of all this, John continued to worship in secret. His religion had cost him his freedom, but at least it hadn't yet cost him his life. You know, I always wonder how many of us would be faithful under those sorts of conditions. But in the midst of John's dungeon, as he faithfully prayed, something happened. It was a marvelous, miraculous occurrence. It was a vision. God reached down and lifted John out of his hell on earth and gave him a glimpse of what heaven would be like. God had taken him up to set up permanent residence in heaven, mind you, but it brought him to heaven for a visit so that John could see what God was doing and could tell the other Christians what he had been shown. It is on this vision on the island of Patmos on which Revelation is based. One of the things John saw was a great crowd of people from every nation and time. They were all ethnic and cultural groups. They were young and old, male and female. They were robed in white and were waving palm branches and singing, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. At that, the angels gathered around the golden thrones and the heavenly elders who represent God's people and the four living creatures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who represent all that God has done. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving be unto God. Honor, power, might, and glory be unto God forever and ever. Then one of the elders turned to John and said, Who are these clothed in white and where did they come from? And John turns it right back to him and says, So you know who they are. Who are these? And the elder replied, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them pure in the blood of the Lamb. These were the Christians and the Jews before them who had been faithful to God in times of trouble and lost their lives because of it. I imagine that as John looked out at the faces of those in that heavenly choir, he could recognize a few faces. The faces of brothers and sisters who had given their lives in service to God. The ones he had known who had been fed to lions and killed by gladiators because of the gospel. And those who had died in the salt mines of Patmos where John was. God wasn't showing John just any heavenly choir that day. God was revealing to John his spiritual destiny and his earthly duty. After all, John had washed his robe in the blood of the Lamb. That is, he had given his life to Christ. And John was going through a time of tribulation. So this would be his reward. He would stand in heaven one day, waving a palm branch, a symbol of victory. And he would be dressed in a heavenly white robe instead of the drab prison uniform he now wore. And he would no longer hurt, hurt hunger, or thirst, or faint in the heat of the sun. 
and God would wipe every tear from his eye. But John's reward was not just in the by and by. You see, the vision gave John hope in the here and now. Hope to face the days of tribulation to come. Strength to see him through all that would happen to him. And John's testimony of all he saw has been an inspiration to Christians ever since. I almost always use part of Revelation 7 when I do a funeral service because it is a word of hope to those who are left behind, not the ones who've already gone and discovered what it's like with God, but a word of hope to the rest of us to remember that God's in charge even when it doesn't seem like it. So today is just another Sunday, right? And like John, we're worshiping God today because that's what Christians do. But the similarity doesn't end there. It's true that none of us fears being imprisoned or killed because of our religion. But the world is still trying to keep us from glorifying God on the Lord's day. The world doesn't threaten us with death. Instead, it entices us. How many times I've heard, I need to do my yard work because Sunday's the only day I have. Forgetting they also had Saturday and spent it probably ball games. No offense on ball games, but if you're going to complain, complain about it real. Or, I didn't get grocery shopping done this week, I have to go to the store. All those different things that entice us. Or it's a family day, and that's the one that just breaks my heart. Yes, it's a family day. Come to church as a family. And then go and have fun doing other things. It's a hard, <coughs> hard thing to get past. There's so many other things that I could tell you about the world. But most of you have discovered it on your own because it's not something that's out there far away. It's something around us all the time. And that's just the beginning. The world is always trying to keep us from glorifying God in our daily lives and it creates things for us to do that keep us from being able to do that. And the gratitude we have that should be God's often goes to something else. And what has God done? Temporarily lifted us above the evil of the world around us. Shown us a choir of gloriously robed saints praising God and one not so gloriously robed who blessed us here. They are the ones who believed in Jesus and been true to him in times of trouble. They are the ones we lifted aloud this morning. They are the ones we miss here on earth that we have given back to God. So the question becomes, might we be in the choir someday? Have you ever been through times of trouble? And I'm looking around and I know you all have. That's the first criteria for joining that choir, by the way. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you can sing or play an instrument. The second criteria is, have you washed your robe in the blood of the Lamb? And this is the closest you're going to get for an altar call from me. Have you put your trust in God and God's Son and the Holy Spirit. So much so that the things of this world do not pull you away. To have God wipe every tear from our eye, to no longer have the sorrow and the pain that is part of human life, that's not just a promise for some time in the future. It's our reality here now. It doesn't mean bad things won't happen to us, but it means we have somebody who gets us through it. When we faithfully trust in Christ, our reward comes now in hope and peace, and later in hope and peace with God. And then when we die, as all humans must, We'll join that heavenly choir of saints doing what we Christians do best, giving our praise and thanksgiving to God, Christ's Spirit. Now take the choir with a grain of salt. I've had farmers say they would rather be on a farm with a whole bunch of other farmers. 
You know, nobody knows what heaven really looks like. So it can be anything. We have farmers revving up their engines. I've had people say they'd rather be with their family and they really don't want to sing. And they're missing kind of the point because the point is giving our praise and thanksgiving to God, Christ's Spirit, which we do here and now. To God be the glory. Amen. Our closing hymn, Lord, dismiss us with their blessing. 671 in the United Methodist Hymn. Thank you.